episode 37. Today we have Edir with us. Edir is the leading data scientist for the production team at Global. Prior to that, Edir also holds a very strong academic background. He has a bachelor and master degree in physics, after which he also holds a PhD in engineering from University of Cambridge. If I understood correctly, this PhD was also supported by the fellowship of Lakaisha. And throughout the whole process, I know it's not the first time that we know a strong data scientist that comes from a very scientific uh, physics math background. And they truly take advantage of their scientific background to put that into the world of machine learning and data science modeling. Uh, with Adria, I believe it's the same. But I do push it one step further with his engineering background. He's exploring the world of data science, but also the world of how to put data science machine learning modeling into production. And that's currently what he's dedicating into in global. So today I'm very excited to he learn more about this process, this scope of work that Adria is leading and welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And yeah, I'm excited for the conversation. Mm -hmm. So to get started, why don't you introduce a bit? It's very curious how people get into the field of data science, especially when you have so much background in even a PhD in engineering and with a lot of background in physics. What, what in the first place that attract your attention into machine learning, into data science? Yeah, so um, after my bachelor in physics, I did a master uh, also in physics, but where I work a lot with optimization, optimizing uh, scientific tools, a new kind of, of microscope. And there I started studying optimization because of that. And uh, um, I started seeing that, as you know, well, optimization is very linked uh, to data science. Um, to, to machine learning, especially, I started getting more interest. Uh, so after the the master, I decided to apply for the PhD in Cambridge, which was actually uh, very based or very focused on machine learning on deep learning, and it was an industrial PhD. So it was applied applied deep learning. Uh, we work with Siemens, um, and uh, so that's what what brought me there. Actually, uh, that basically when I started studying optimization, I, I got a bit hooked to the field, and then I couldn't live anymore. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you get the taste of it while doing your PhD thesis projects. And so I imagine you started with a very extensive research background. And then the, at the moment when you put all your research and academic side of machine learning, modeling, scientific background into production, how was the transition like? Yeah, I think that that's one of the most interesting or things in, in my, the last two years of my life and the things I learned most, because there are a lot of differences and some similarities. Um, the differences basically is in when you do research, you typically focus a lot on newer methods. You always have to contribute something new to the field. Otherwise it's pointless to do research. So everything is very fancy, a bit complex. Um, you don't really focus that much in practical scalability, more on the method being new and obviously working working better than, than older methods. Mm -hmm. um, so when I joined Globo, I joined with the routing team, uh, which for example, calculates how long a courier is predicted to take uh, to go from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And one of our hopes in Globo uh, with me, et cetera, was to try to use some of these very fancy new methods at the time when I, a bit new, not super new, but like LSTMs, it's a type of recurrent neural network, et cetera, which we didn't have in production at the time. Mm -hmm. And actually, we realized that for several reasons, um, methods like, uh, like GBM, um, like, you know, gradient boosting machines, et cetera, which are much more classical, mm -hmm. were actually overperforming um, and much simpler to use, to deploy, to train, to optimize than, than LSTMs for use cases. So I learned basically that, that deep learning is not always the answer. And mm -hmm. although it's true that on big amounts of data, it would tend to beat classic machine learning. It's also true that for industrial purposes, it's not always the, the best decision. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a thing that's very different. I think that's very similar is we have, I think a very nice process in Globo in which we borrow some of the, the things that are done in research and we use it in the industry. Uh, for instance, uh, we have RFCs, which is a type of document that means request for comment, which is a bit similar to a peer review process in, in, in uh, science. 
it's maybe not as strict, but we still, before we put a new model or a new feature in production, we send these documents where we describe it quite carefully. And then it has to have approval from two people that are not on our team and then review from any other person in the community. They can leave their comments, et cetera. Interesting. So that, that's super useful, I think, and it allows you to not mess up things too much and also to incorporate knowledge from other data scientists in what you do. And mm -hmm. finally, I mean, this other example is very well known, but the, the PR review process in, in GitHub or, you know, when you want to merge uh, your rank into master, we also have a, a reviewing process, which is a bit similar to what you would do in science as well. Sure, sure. I like when you mentioned the concept when research is one thing, but when you put into production, it's not the, the most fancy, the most sophisticated algorithm, that's the best. And with that being said, there's a data we collect that's saying about only many companies claim they have machine learning models they are developing in the area, but only 22% of the companies actually deploy those models, put them into production. So we see the big gap between, okay, we have state of the art models to, okay, we are actually using them. And mm -hmm. I believe that is your mission and your job currently at Global. And that touch on the aspect that I really want to learn from you today, which is the machine learning ops in, in the mm -hmm. traditional world, we don't know software engineering, we have DevOps and mm -hmm. in data team, we know there's data engineering, but this new category, which is at the crossroad of machine learning, data engineering and the DevOps is this, this is the new sector. And that is exactly what you're focusing on. And what's your understanding of this? Yeah, and first of all, comment on that. My, for our experience, when we talk to other data scientists, like you know, friends of mine working in the area, uh, et cetera, is that this is actually true that many companies are not yet, or are just now starting to put their models into production. I'm talking about maybe medium companies. I think the very big ones, I mean, Facebook, et cetera, of course, have had their models in production for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it is, for let's say a, a lot of startups, a pretty new field in a way. Um, yeah. So, so I think maybe in the last uh, five years, or maybe you know, last ten years, a lot of it was doing very experimental still, and now this is starting to be standardized the same way that DevOps has been standardized, right? So yeah, we, we also see that that there's a bit of discrepancy between what the companies say they do and what they really do when you dig when you dig down on, on the reality, whether it's in production or not. Mm -hmm. And as you said, my team is exactly that. It, it aims to speed up productionization of machine learning models and it aims to standardize the practices, the ML practices in the company. We work super closely. Actually, now we have the same manager as the machine learning platform, which is a team of only uh, software engineers, no data scientists that build the machine learning infrastructure at Global. And we are like okay. the data science team that helps them. Mm -hmm. And yeah, well, MLOps is, is a really um, broad field because it touches many techniques. Um, mm -hmm. If I were to summarize it, is it takes nearly everything or a lot of the techniques of DevOps, like continuous integration, continuous development, canary, canary releases, I don't know, mm -hmm. a, a lot of techniques that, that you would know uh, in, in DevOps. Mm -hmm. And it adds a lot of particularities of, of machine learning. Um, the main particularity of machine learning is the statistics uh, based uh, particularities of the field. So for example, things such as distribution drift, like the feature distribution can vary and therefore okay. you might have to, to redeploy according to this drift. Things such as um, often when you deploy a service in DevOps, you just care that the service works and okay that the service doesn't have a box, right? Um, but in machine learning, you care about KPIs, about things such as accuracy and things such as accuracy actually are a bit harder to calculate because as, as in the example with the career that I said, you don't know the ground truth of the model until the career has arrived to the place, right? So That's you need true. a whole processing system to, to process this ground truth, which is different than the traditional uh, DevOps in, in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And well, things that, that we all know, no, like the, the famous train test validation split, do it well, um, no checking that the model is actually generalizing. There are a lot of concerns in MLOps with which also exist in DevOps, but regarding latency of your endpoints of your APIs, um, yeah, which are, here in Global we're, we're especially concerned of. Okay, are there cases where 
like you deploy a model and it turned out to be a completely disaster. It's not accurate yeah. at all. And can you yeah. give us the introduction and uh, what did you do after to re rescue that? Well, we have a few, this has happened more than once. Um, uh -huh. In my case, I, I am trying to think one, one, one big one. Well, what has happened to me, particularly myself, is rather that I thought I deployed a model, but there was a problem in the backend job that had to process it and it wasn't deployed at all. So in that sense, it wasn't that the model wasn't accurate, but I, I, there are some examples in which the model was not accurate. Um, and a lot of uh, the times what happened to us is a feature mismatch. Like we were, what we thought we were passing to the model is mm -hmm. not what we were passing to the model. Okay. Um, uh, so for example, like because our backend is separate from the API. So the API is, is basically um, written in Python and it communicates with the backend through our contracts, which is a type of contract that, that negotiates the fields that get passed and then Python reads, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, basically we were passing the, the wrong thing, for example, uh, and then the model was, was very underperforming. Um, there, there's all sort of bugs um, that, that can happen. We try, like basically every time we find a bug of this type, we roll out new type of, of tests. And we okay. try to have also end-to-end -end tests that include this passing from the backend to the, the API, et cetera, mm -hmm. to try to check that the predictions as we have them locally, like we you know, pass something to our estimator, see what the prediction is, coincides with what will happen if it's called if the API is called in, in reality. Mm -hmm. And then if those values match, we know that it's working uh, the right way. We also mm -hmm. can debug our APIs locally. We can, we can deploy in stage and from a Python notebook, we can basically do API calls and see the responses and see yeah. that, that things will work well. Yeah, that's some practice that I see quite a lot is like you test it locally and then you put it into product production, like to have a final check. And that, really explains how the difference between the traditional DevOps versus the machine learning ops is the data gets in through, right? At the beginning, you need to make sure the data quality is right and the fields, the features are correct. You need to train the model, but later you need to validate in real time to see how the performance is. And the whole process is ultra complicated. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There is an, an additional little thing. Well, it's also related to the data, but there are issues of that maybe you, the database where you have the data you use for training is a bit different than what you have in real time. Mm -hmm. And maybe you think you have some features available, but those features are not really available uh, because you have it in, in the database, but you have it because it was processed with an ETL after the fact, but maybe okay. in real time you don't have the features. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we also recommend always knowing, you know, what, what's there and what's not there. Sure, sure. And I also, I was aware of another good practice, which is called data versioning, I guess is to be used in this process when you have some unexpected feature mismatch mm -hmm. happening, you just go back. And do you use that in your current work? And how does that help? So we are not using uh, data versioning uh, in general, although we, we're going to roll it out. Uh, okay. So we don't use it yet. We do have some child version of it. Um, so our tests, the this API test that we have, the end-to-end -end test, et cetera, have control data that, that gets used. So basically we store this data in the cloud, we, we take it so to make sure that we have full control of which data is used, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think data versioning is definitely uh, super useful and something that, that we also aim to move uh, to. Um, okay. It's like the last piece and it's this part of, as you said, of data engineering. And actually we've seen that data engineering is very crucial. And I think often a bit forgotten by data scientists because it's maybe the field that we get to touch a bit less. And it's a bit maybe more obscure to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's, it's hugely important. Yeah, I cannot agree with more. I come from a field where I think business and machine learning are the magical match and I'm super interested to get any 
sample data set and then train a wonderful model and but mm. later to put into production when I on my job I really need to do that I ran mm. into such a big blocker because the, all the problems are revealing the real world comes in and the process is just difficult you need to ship into cloud the whole infrastructure mm. the whole world of engineering really appeared to me not that long ago I realized the importance and start really appreciating it that's why I think your work mm. is so crucial then, then I was wondering, in your team, when you recruit people in your team who may be from background of data scientists, from engineering mm -hmm. to do the production work, where do they come from and why do they develop the interest and how do you set so, up the mission? Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have like basically uh, two roles, machine learning engineers, oh, a part of data engineers, which I'm not going to go into. Machine learning engineers, I don't recruit them myself. And they have a much strong software development background, Java background as well, um, mm. infra, infra background. And then the data scientists, which is the ones I, I recruit for my team, mm -hmm. I uh, always, okay, so it, it is actually very, a very hard task to, to recruit good data scientists for what we want to do. Because to be honest with you, as the field is relatively new, mm. we often have to make a judgment call between okay, this person knows how to code. He has never deployed a machine learning model in production. However, maybe we don't have many candidates that have. Yeah. And this person understands machine learning really well. So for example, if a person knows how to code well, they have a GitHub that's public or, or they can prove to us that they know how to code um, you know, and, and have very solid theoretical background in, in machine learning. Mm -hmm. Even if they have never deployed, we might consider them. Then, of course, if somebody has deployed and has, has experience in MLOps, it's a plus. But we mm -hmm. have uh, rejected several candidates that have had experience in MLOps, um, according to, to their CV, mm -hmm. but then um, had very low um, machine learning knowledge or um, didn't seem to substantiate this experience. So it's, it's always a complicated process. And we have a pipeline. I don't have the exact numbers, but I think uh, we might hire about one or two percent of the the applicants. I have to say we have lots of applicants, so this is mm -hmm. we have a lot of people apply a bit a bit randomly. Yeah. But I think last time I saw was seventeen over several hundred, maybe eight or nine hundred. Wow. Uh, so, so this is something that we struggle with, and I think many companies struggle with finding this profile because mm -hmm. it's new. And yeah, yeah. if, as you said, if only twenty percent of us actually do it. How are you going to find experienced people that has done it? And... Yeah, I can see the difficulty of putting a team like that together, which is often quite classical in many hiring recruiting process. It's like you never have the perfect candidate for the job you want to mm -hmm. do. Usually it involves a bit of checking the baseline knowledge and then decide to dedicate time to train them on the job. So, but on the other side, I can see it's already difficult to put a team together. But once you have the team, how do you infuse this mindset of data science, modeling, efficiency, production, this kind of mindset into mm. the whole company? You have such a big ana data analyst, like data, data science team. How do you do it? Mm. Yeah, that, this has been a major challenge. Um, when, when I started in Central DS, the team didn't even exist. And we had this infrastructure, the machine learning platform, which was quite new, maybe less than a year old. And um, pretty, the way it was written, it was a bit convoluted for data scientists to understand because it was written by software developments. For mm -hmm. instance, our classes were extremely deep, like, and they're still a bit deep, but we kept inheriting from um, a, a mother class, maybe seven times over. The methods were not very exposed. So it was a bit hard to get new data scientists to use the platform because it was a bit complicated to understand. Mm -hmm. um, but it was the best tool by far. That was like it was basically the only real tool we had to put things in production. Okay. Um, we had other models, legacy that were in production, but were in production um, in a, tools that were not generalizable. Were tools that the data scientist had written for him or herself, you know, and couldn't be extended to other use cases. Uh -huh. So basically, um, I I tried to do several things. One thing that I did is I created a help center that our team owns that acted as a buffer between the data scientists and the machine learning platform team. Because, and it solved two problems. Solved the problem that complexity 
that was high was summarized by us to the data scientists. So they would open a ticket saying, I want to put this model into production. And the ticket was structured in such a way that we, they would have to put everything we needed to know to help them. So they would say it was, it was a just statistics model or an actual machine learning model that would have to be served as an endpoint, for example. By statistics model, I mean, we have some models that just calculate some quantiles of distribution and okay. push that to a database. Okay. Um, which features would it use, et cetera, et cetera. And then we would read that, go, and because we had huge exposure to both the infra, the machine learning platform, and the other models that were, had been productionalized, we would tell them, hey, what you want to do has already been done, and point them to the documentation or write new documentation, because we don't have documentation on many of these things, and even assign them a data scientist to help, which at the beginning, there were only two or three in the team, so it was many times it was myself. Yeah. Um, so we, we served as a buffer. And another thing we did is we had bi-weekly meetings with the manager or weekly and then one extra um, sometimes with the manager of the machine learning platform. Mm -hmm. And I basically every week uh, tried to push towards what the data scientists I cl as clients needed. So more simplicity, um, more ex uh, explanation, certain parts, uh, you know, there were several, several small issues that, you know, when I heard from data scientists, this is a problem. I would um, ask the, the engineers to, to help. Mm -hmm. So with those, these two things, I think we multiplied. Um, I'm quoting by, by mind, it might be more, it might be less, but I think we went from something like 10 models to something like 50 or something like that in the platform or 40 okay. some. Uh -huh. uh, so in, in, I think now it's been, I think now it's been two quarters. Uh, so pretty fast. Uh, transition mm -hmm. also no, it is not our merit uh, solely we mm -hmm. hired a lot of really good data scientists in our product teams mm -hmm. that they themselves i mean at the end it's not me who's writing the models eh? yeah it's the, the this data scientist did a huge effort and a really good job at, at, at putting all these models into production and, and mm -hmm. it's on them really the merit but yeah so th this basically has made that this platform and this way of working has become the standard way we do it in, in global. Mm -hmm. And this makes us much more confident of when we put things into production that they are working well because we all use the same code base, we all follow the same practices, et cetera. Uh -huh. So I'm very curious to dig into more detail when you say code base, is that when you say you have about 50 models, is that you have a chunk of code that's specifically for, let's say you, if you need a time series predict, prediction and you have this mm -hmm. chunk of code that you just recommend the data science to use and put adjust their models before and after to use that or what do you mean broadly speaking is a bit like that you probably have seen sometimes the scalar and estimator class where you have this predict fit methods you know that many estimators use use the same methods where you know you have a dot fit you have the estimator fitted, then you have dot predict and so on. No? So mm -hmm. we have the global version of this, a bit more complex and very specific to our infrastructure, mm -hmm. where maybe we we'll have a method which is to download artifacts from our cloud, or mm -hmm. we we'll have a method which is query our databases. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy for us to query our databases from these estimators. Okay. Um, so we have such a such a class, which is our base class. Yes. And uh, then we inherit from that class to create a base class for each specific model. Okay. So for example, if it's a time series model, there's a time series base class for that model. And then the estimator, that's why it's a bit deep, but then the, the different versions, code uh -huh. versions, if many different features, et cetera, of the model inherit from that class. Uh -huh. So what we do when somebody put a model to, I know that this being a bit maybe abstract now, but somebody creates a model they want to put in production. I see, okay, as you said, it's a time series. These other people did already a time series model. Mm -hmm. So more or less, this is the scaffolding, the structure you have to follow. I point to the model that's in production. Mm -hmm. And this model will have used all these common classes I talked about. So it, it's even simpler than that in the sense that uh, they just go there, ah, okay, this is how it's, it's done. Mm -hmm. And abstract it a little bit and do it for the use case. Mm -hmm. um, we have also designed these classes so as I said, they are linked to our specific databases mm -hmm. and to the specific particularities of real time operations, which is most of what Global does. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it makes it easier for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So if I understand correctly, it's more like a reference library where if you need something, you can have a reference to point into that's in production, then you adopt their best practices. Yeah, but but um, so we have some models that are libraries, but mm -hmm. then we have like within a single repo, all these subfolders that each uh, responds to the model in production. Mm -hmm. So then they just edit this. And actually these folders are automatically generated. So whenever you want to productionize a model, there is a code, you put some, some inputs there, it will do the scaffolding, a very general uh -huh. scaffolding of your model uh -huh. and create it already. Okay. Um, we, we use Terraform as well uh, to automatically generate our infrastructure, um, impressive. which simplifies us uh, uh -huh. a lot. And I want to put up a word for two technologies that, that I think are super important. Mm -hmm. One that's very well known, which is Docker. So each of our models yeah. has its own Docker uh, uh, file, which creates its own environment that it will it will work on. Mm -hmm. And another one that that I discovered recently, and I'm a big promoter, thanks to a, a member of my team uh, called Alesh, um, which is uh, poetry instead of requirements to manage the the dependencies of our of your Python projects. What is it called? Um, Poetry, like a poet, poetry. but uh, okay. yeah. Um, so if, if there's people interested in MLOps, I recommend taking a look. I actually really like it. We'll um, definitely add it to the show notes because <laughs> yeah. data science is all about keeping yourself updated about the new package and libraries tools. And... Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. And I found this is a lot, the hardest part of being a manager now that I'm, well, since I lead a team, it is the hardest part, making sure you're doing the late thing and that you do the right decisions. Uh huh. So talking about this, I, that is really related to another question I want to ask you is leading a team as such that is like ranging from engineer, data science, even machine learning model deployment expert. What, what is the challenge? Like you mentioned, one is to keep updated about the latest knowledge. Are there any other aspects that is really difficult? Yeah, so there are several things. No, one thing is we have a, we use Jira, you probably are aware, like basically Agile. Um, and Agile is very thought, and which is very related to DevOps, basically it's linked to, directly to DevOps in most companies. No? But it's very thought and design uh, for software engineering. Mm -hmm. In the sense that when you work with engineers, you often can say, this is your task concentrate it on a ticket and give it to an engineer. And as long mm -hmm. as it's the right type of engineer, they will solve it because it's a very specific task. No? Mm -hmm. But in data science, it's not like that because um, if you are doing exploration of a data science initiative, it might not work. Like it, at the end, it's called data science because you do science, it's experimental data. You're trying mm -hmm. to build a model of the world like scientists do. And that sometimes is super hard or untractable or really, or it doesn't work. So I think a, a real problem we have in the field is a lot of managers, including myself, eh, perhaps like uh, that come to the field thinking that's like their last software engineering team or <laughs> that and thinking that this is going to be like the ticket is going to get done in, you know, three days, but mm -hmm. it just doesn't, science doesn't work like that. So <laughs> this is the main difference in my opinion between software development and, and machine learning, sorry, and data science. So you need to know how to manage this. You need to know how to communicate and you need to know to understand that uh, yourself as a manager, that things, can, some things are just super hard or, I mean, we have had many times, you know, as I said, I myself, I was spending nearly a quarter with developing, uh, you know, deep learning for certain, some of our models. And we ended up dropping it because yeah, it beat it, uh, uh, radiant boosting machines in certain parts, but it just wasn't worth it because of several other, um, uh, fallbacks. Uh, mm -hmm. So it is what it is, you know, and I uh, thank God I wasn't fired because my manager understood that yeah. this is just how sometimes things are. Um, mm -hmm. And now I have more experience and maybe I would have uh, cut it a bit shorter, but mm -hmm. it, this, is a, this is a main difference. It I is a process. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think for us is everyone learn about all the glamour side of when a machine learning algorithm outcompetes and does super excellent job, they, but they don't know how many models have failed and how many tests has been like trashed. 
in, in the background. So thank you for sharing that. Meanwhile, I can yeah. imagine if I'm, uh, I'm joining the team as an analyst or data scientist, I believe there is so many good practices that I'm not aware of because in my mind, there's just no linkage about, okay, I have a model. Now the production part is something I need to take care of. So from your perspective, do you see some typical like pitfalls that people go through when they are like from data scientists, when they are producing models, are there some best practices that you can recommend to people so people can start putting that mindset yeah. of production? Yeah, um, we actually do give a, a presentation to every data scientist that joins Global, mm -hmm. like summarizing some of those. Bear in mind, we are an operations company, which means we actually send staff here and there. We have actual people, you know, humans that have to pick up the stuff, humans yeah. that have to eat. So uh, we are not, and I'm not disrespecting it. I think it's a company that works greatly, but we're not Netflix in the sense that if Game of Thrones takes a while to load, you will be angry as a customer, but that's where the thing's gonna end, right? <laughs> you might not even cancel your, your subscription. Uh -huh. But in our case, if you don't get your food, Mm -hmm. uh, more than once you leave for sure mm -hmm. and uh, or you know if you have careers without working we, we have um the careers that uh, well remember they are not employed by us but but they because they are not employed by us they can choose to work for other competitor so if yeah. we're not good to them they leave as well so we need our operations to work really well so it, what we in that light we tell data scientists a few principles one of them is to aim for simplicity and reliability because we're an operations company. So make mm -hmm. sure things won't fail. Always design your algorithms, your 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 models to be scalable worldwide. Uh, we have APIs that receive, um, uh, I think it's it's over thirty thousand calls per minute batched, which means hundreds of thousands of calls to the to the model, and. Uh, yeah, we, we have very high load uh, because, you know, we have millions of orders uh, a month and we are global and therefore you have to design your algorithms to be deployable everywhere. Otherwise, mm -hmm. what's the project work for? Uh, we also tell them to always have a, a baseline, even if it's simple statistics baseline or very simple, very quick to train model to know you are not spending weeks and weeks and weeks against nothing like and you're not beating a simple baseline. Um, right. So we also suggest um, always that. And um, finally, I think I'm not forgetting anything is to, to follow this internal process I talked about with the RFC document where you request for a comment and all the data scientists, et cetera. And finally, very sure to remember what your job is, meaning, you, you know, um, your job as a data scientist, for example, shouldn't be the same as the job as a product manager. Like we don't want data scientists to be all the time managing stakeholders and only managing stakeholders. You should be doing what you're hired for. And uh, I mean, this is not generally a super big problem, but but we insist on, on that as well. Okay, interesting. So simplicity, know what your truly your mission is and uh, mm. yeah, have a ground truth, the standard. I believe this is a very good practice for every data science to keep in their mind. Especially, I like the case you're mentioning how being a data scientist at Global is like, your model is into production and it's truly immediate impact and it's a trigger that has a lot of leverage. So mm -hmm. very, very interesting to learn about. Then after going through all the, like you see the impressive power, the speed of your machine learning algorithm, your infrastructure, and of all the intellectual properties of the knowledge that developed in global, do you share any of those knowledge with the public? Is there any public APIs that you can pass on models? Uh, we're going towards sharing some of this knowledge. Um, we, at as an example, at the end of every RFC that we have, this request for common documents, is there, a, there is a question, sorry, asking if there's potential to make this open source. Mm -hmm. So we definitely want to do that. Um, we, for example, have some very detailed um, posts about our infrastructure. 
Um, for example, recently our engineers gave a talk, uh, a pretty long session where they detailed very well what their infrastructure was. Uh, that was maybe seven months ago. We have this post that recently that some people in the routing team wrote about our real-time um, our real-time features uh, infrastructure, which is a way to gather in real time statistical aggregates of of features. For example, how busy a city is, etc. And the whole infrastructure is detailed in that in those. I choose a series of three blog posts because it's so detailed that it is detailed. Mm -hmm. That is had to be sorry, it had to be breaking now. Uh -huh. And so, but I have to recognize with you, we don't have I think that I know data science, we don't have any open source repo, for example, which would be great. Mm. It's not because the company is against it. It's also because people are very busy <laughs> sometimes. Uh -huh. And sometimes people also, when you put something open source, it has to be really good, right? So yeah. it has to be a, a very, very round project. Hopefully now that we have more capacity, we can do that. Okay. That said, we use heavily open source and I recommend always be, uh, in front of the doubt use uh -huh. open source uh, yeah. because it's amazing it's really well maintained it's it's free mm -hmm. and uh, yeah we like nearly all the times i've seen an open source um option versus a proprietary version nearly every time i've seen the open source being better uh, mm -hmm. so that's you have some recommendations something that you use heavily with your day-to-day well, yeah, I mean, like all the famous um, uh, Python libraries for data science are, are mm. open source. Uh, yeah. Like, I don't know if, if there's anything uh, that our our listeners wouldn't know about. I mean, I can say my personal opinions mm -hmm. of some versus others. Like, I, I like PyTorch much more than TensorFlow, but that's a personal thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because the, the and I, okay, I would say if anybody is doubting, give it a try uh, because the bugging is much easier and it's a bit easier to understand the way uh, deep learning is structured there. Mm -hmm. I, another recommendation, uh, you can actually find mm -hmm. um, which are the uh, Python repos that are gathering more attention recently. So if you Google something like most uh, used Python repos, I think it is, or most used, it, it's a search similar to this. Uh, okay. You get a list and you uh -huh. can order it by, by stars, you can order it by, by recent attention. And that's very cool because you get these new machine learning uh, repos that you might not have heard of, mm -hmm. which might be very useful, uh, depends on which type of company you are, right? But uh, definitely, ah, and, and now you reminded me of one tool that people might not know about. Uh, have you heard about UMAP? Uh, no, UMAP. So UMAP with a with a U uh, mm -hmm. is a, a dimensionality reduction, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. is an unsupervised embedding generator that mm -hmm. uh, is amazing. And if you Google UMAP, you will see we actually use it in production in some models. And uh, yeah, I think it's it's far superior than than well, I won't say it's far superior than PCA because PCA is much faster, but it, it's a great it's a great uh, it's a great package to use for dimensionality reduction to get to get embeddings and uh, and so on. So I really I really recommend it. And many people don't know about it. So UMAP is is the thing. <laughs> okay, awesome. I will definitely check it out and link it to the show notes so our audience can it's, have a look at it as well. It, it's similar to TSNE but better. Okay, cool. <laughs> Maybe you will get people approaching you asking about the details and then you can go <laughs> into <you> more depth. <laughs> We, we oh. have a UMAP evangelist in the company. I will refer oh. them to our evangelist. <laughs> All awesome. our algorithms are, are UMAP. <laughs> yeah, it's cool that you have such a big team and the people can discuss those issues in person and within a similar context. So with that being said, I think at the very last, I would like to ask you some recommendations for people who want to learn more about the field. Are there any like media channels you fo follow? Are there any books, videos you would recommend to people? Yeah. Um, okay. So, like personal opinion again. Uh, I think if you want to learn deep learning, just read Deep Learning by Goodfellow, and it's I'm not gonna say it's all you need to know, but it's really amazing. Uh, Goodfellow is a huge, very good writer. Even his papers, his, the original hand paper, you probably might be thinking, oh wow, that's gonna be heavy. No, it's super understandable. 
um, GAN meaning the generative adversarial networks that are, um, you know, one of the top methods on, in deep learning. So that's a great book. I would fully recommend it. Um, uh, actually, I myself did the exercise recently of going on the, the, the book has a fine, uh, section at the end, which is research topics on mm -hmm. deep learning. And I went topic by topic and tried to implement it in Python and so on. And some of it I couldn't, to be honest, some, most of them I could. Mm -hmm. uh, because they are already implementations, you can just follow them, etc. And mm -hmm. it's a huge, it's a great exercise. So yeah, so that that's so for more classical machine learning and statistics, I don't have many people ask for a very good statistics book, and I'm sorry to say that I don't have a source that I love. And for following the field, I what I said about the Python reports is a great idea. There's another amazing web page that I think that with this two you are served, to be honest, which mm -hmm. is called Papers with Code. Papers with You might code. know about, yeah, Papers with Code. I it's amazing that. because, uh -huh. so it, you have all the fields of machine learning structured. You get, click on there, I mean, it's a bit hard to explain. You click on there, you get the latest papers which have include, included, so you can replicate the results. Mm -hmm. You get the databases and it's structured in a really nice way because you can search by task, you can search by, type of algorithm by, I don't know, new types of loss function. So those two are, are amazing. Then, I mean, everybody knows about Medium and so on, but I would say Medium is great, but I would ask people to be a bit careful with Medium because yeah. it's not, well, I mean, you have to be careful about that. Medium is great. I don't want to be here, seem like I don't like Medium, but um, there is the type of, of phenomenon over somebody can post a very a thing that's not very correct, but this person maybe is like a very high in, I don't know, their company, let's say making a McKinsey post it and get shared. Everybody votes it, but maybe it's not good, you know? And mm -hmm. it, in Medium, you always have to take it more with a pinch of salt, I, in my opinion, than let's say papers with code, which at least one sure. for a review process. Mm -hmm. The level of scrutiny with the articles can be a little bit varies. Mm -hmm. Also, yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else you would like uh, to add at the end of the talk? Uh, well, I guess one more thing I forgot to say when you asked me mm -hmm. the challenges uh, for, you know, being a, a lead, I, I was very, you know, specific about Jira and so on, but I also want to say that um, I think another challenge that, that's been hard to learn, I'm still learning is this prioritization oh. and kind of like ranking of projects uh, Every, for everyone yeah yeah so this is this is always a uh, a bit hard uh, to because also you need to balance something that your data scientists want to work in which is something fancy and new and yeah. something that the company will profit uh, profit from mm -hmm. and um, yeah this i i'm sorry to say i don't have the full solution yet i i you know this matrix i like this matrix with difficulty and return and so on i think this is pretty useful but this is a challenge I'm, I'm still actually working on and uh, and I hope I hope to learn more about it. And, uh, uh -huh. yeah. If of our audience who is facing a similar problem or they have another opinion, some good suggestions, we can start a, a discussion group. It's always something Yeah, <laughs> Or maybe, I, I don't know, I wonder what, I guess you also face uh, a similar yeah. cha the similar challenge. No, I don't mm -hmm. know if you have any trick or, or anything you would like to add. Um, I think it's a constantly ongoing bad one, depending on where you are. From my side, um, I have a lot of stakeholders to serve with the data team. And what I do is ask the team to prioritize their task for me first. And then mm -hmm. what I really look at um, is the company's overall direction, what is really important for the company, then ranking mm -hmm. from there. And then in terms of team, I think I'm I'm really trying to make every project as interesting as possible for the team member. Even though it's something mm -hmm. simple, I try to explain to them how this is contributing to the overall company roadmap. Mm -hmm. Like try to align the vision with the team member. So they understand even though the task is not as fancy, they are still like contributing a lot and their work matters. But on the other side, mm -hmm. what I really focus on is to give my team member the time to learn. Like every week I dedicate them one or two hours and I don't ask them mm -hmm. why, what, how, they just learn whatever topic they want. 
And I think it's very key to boost the moral happening and then they usually discover something really relevant with what we are doing and go into more mm -hmm. depth. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. We do have that on Friday. It's called Back to School Fridays in Friday oh. afternoon. I like the but title. Maybe I'll see yeah, it. <laughs> I, I, I think it's something that if you promote it actively, mm -hmm. the team does more. And I think it's super useful because finally they find this paper which, hey, we shouldn't do it this way, shouldn't that, that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And so basically you ask them to rank it, no? According uh -huh. to, to, to their own personal uh, idea, but then you kind of modify it a little bit according to your company's OKRs or whatever yeah. methodology. Yeah, yeah that makes precisely. Sense. Mm -hmm. And for the learning, there is also an add-on. At the beginning, I do blog like every one or two hours every week. But I understand like the team when this gets to the rhythm, they start to, oh, I have an emergency task. I stopped learning a session. Now what we mm -hmm. do is we have a competition board within the team. Mm -hmm. So whatever you learned every week, you just choose your time, flexible hours, and you put your mm -hmm. learning on the board. And then we compete with each other as who is learning more and who can share more with the team. And that is working oh, quite well. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really nice. Yeah. I mean, th this, these things are, are because, you know, when you come from, from a technical background, I think uh, as yourself, well, I'm not sure, but you were a data scientist, no? And, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, the technical backgrounds are very well constrained and very clear how to do things. Um, yeah. And management is a much softer skill. Yeah. And it's really good to, to, I think, share tips and hear tips. Yeah, and, it's... And, uh, there is Even immense if, opportunities, possibilities of doing things, and it's it's very fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so if yeah, um, I don't know if you if have any other question. I mean, the last last one would be if people want to get in touch with you to learn more and just to communicate. What's the best way to reach out? Yeah, they can reach me in LinkedIn. Maybe it's a possibly the best way. I also mm -hmm. have an email. Um, but I think LinkedIn is the best way because my email sometimes is a little bit between swarmed and, and neglected <laughs> or, <Okay>. or both. <laughs> okay. But LinkedIn, LinkedIn actually, I, I kind of, uh, I think I'm faster at replying at LinkedIn. Perfect. Um, if they Google Adria Salvador, I mean, it's we'll going to be We'll add your profile to the page. So yeah, yeah. Add, all good. Add, you can chat me with me at any point, grab a coffee if you're in Barcelona. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm pretty open guy, and even we're pretty open companies. Not not yeah. many uh, secrets, I think. In the in the in also in the field, I think the field is very uh, because we use so many open source tools. If you're starting, kind of easy to get get in the field, I think. And uh, yeah, yeah, reach out to me. I'll I'll be happy to have a chat and to meet the wider community in Barcelona. I think we're quite a lot of of people working in MLOps and data science in Barcelona, right? And we must be more than, what must be the number? Maybe even nearly a thousand maybe or, or something like that, maybe. Yeah. yeah because That's... we are already 60 or so in global data scientists, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll start calling the people's attention and the one day we'll, we'll start a conversation going from here. <laughs> All right. Sure. Thank you very much, Azir, for your interesting talk. And there is a lot of rich knowledge on the aspect of ML ops, and uh, you dive into many details. And really appreciate how you share the challenge aspects about it as well. Very honest, and uh, it's truly useful for us to get exposure about the background, not only the glamorous side. It's very relevant topic, and hopefully we can stir in more interest toward the field, more people joining the conversation. Sure. Thank you very much, Sam. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, yeah, 